Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So today we're still talking about more of the, the modern world. Today specifically, we're going to talk about some of the problems in modern society. Specifically, uh, two of the biggest ones that have been around since the beginning of human existence. Poverty and hunger. And while this sounds like it's going to be a huge downer, and if we're being honest, it is going to be a little bit of a downer, but I think uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised uh, by the end today on some of the uh, progress we've made on both of those fronts. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So even though the growth of the human population has absolutely skyrocketed present day, um, some of the old school issues uh, still exist and, and can get exacerbated. Uh, specifically, what we're going to start talking about today is, is poverty and hunger. Now, an important thing to point out here is the United Nations, which we have talked uh, quite a bit about in previous units, especially the UN Security Council and specific wars. Uh, the United Nations isn't just here for battle. They are here for the entire collective globalization concept that everybody is interconnected. So much so that in 1948, they passed the Declaration of Human Rights, which clarifies that all humans are, are, are equal. There's not one group of human better than another group of human, um, which is pretty important considering this is coming three years after the end of the Holocaust, uh, in which widespread racism and discrimination on like a lethal scale uh, had been seen for the United Nations, which is pretty much every country on earth to get together, and agree that, that human life is human life and everybody has basic rights they are entitled to. Uh, stuff like life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, stuff that America has based uh, our values on as well. The reason that's important is uh, once the United Nations values and everybody acknowledges all human life is the same, when one specific region is really struggling, whether it's, it's uh, famine, uh, ridiculous poverty, uh, things like that, the rest of the world, because of the UN, and there's this platform here, there is this ability for countries to come together and really focus on what they can do to help out uh, uh, these, these other countries uh, and uh, these places that are absolutely struggling. We're going to talk about today some of the poverty and um, uh, famine situations that have occurred over time in the world and specifically why it's happening in some of the places that it is and certain examples of how it can be remedied. So the question is, why is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights so important? It basically is the world coming together saying, hey, we're going to look out for each other. Uh, this had never been done before. Um, because of globalization, because of the growth in the population, it is obvious that you got to kind of take care of your neighbor as opposed to just survive and hope your neighbor doesn't kill you, which is pretty much what societies had been, been like for a long time. Now it's, all right, if I'm good enough to be able to help my neighbor, let's do that, and we, and we all work together. A little bit of a kumbaya thing, but there are quite a few situations in which the United Nations has gone in and been very influential, some in a small scale, some in a larger scale. Um, but let's talk a little bit here. So pause me here and answer that completely. I want to talk here a little bit about poverty because this is mind-blowing. Now, I made that this is uh, uh, my world history curriculum. Uh, when I made, I was picking and choosing from there because the curriculum's change, always updating it. I went back uh, as I'm redoing this curriculum and saw these facts here. I made this curriculum about 10 years ago. When I wrote this about 10 years ago, it's, it's 2022 now, so it's about 2012. Uh, I made this about 10 years ago and using the resources I had in 2012, which are probably from 2005 when I made this in 2012. Uh, this was accurate data and it's mind blowing. All right. So when I made this in 2012, which granted might've been based off of data from 2005, that half of the world's population, because there's only 6 billion people at the time. That's how fast the population's rising. Half the world's population live on less than $2 a day, $2 a day. Uh, is considered extreme poverty. Not $2 an hour at a job. 
$2 a day, which is about $700 a year. If you have less than $700 per year, that is what's considered extreme poverty by the UN. That seems baffling to us. But half of the world's population lives in that, uh, uh, in that vacuum of extreme poverty. 790 million people cannot read or write on Earth. All right, Almost a billion people, if you wanted to round up. Uh, so, and at this time when this is made, of one out of six people, I'd probably be more one out of eight, one out of nine, math-wise, uh, on Earth cannot read or write. They are illiterate. Massive gap between the, the rich and the poor. Uh, there's massive uh, uh, situations where countries in poverty are at high risk for civil wars. Um, because when there's not a lot of resources, people are willing to fight each other for it. Um, uh, poverty and just famine, it just seems to follow the same regions over time. And that's kind of a chicken or the egg. Why is that? Like, like what started first? Is it all their political problems or was it the famine or is it the poverty? Uh, they're they're kind of interconnected. Now, those first couple facts I have here, half the world's population, 790 million people can't read or write. When I went to update this, I didn't want to change it because I thought it's, you got to give some positive because we're going to talk about a lot of negatives here. Uh, so when I went and looked this up here as I'm redoing the curriculum, um, I, I thought I would find some graphs that would validate that half the world lived in extreme poverty. That actually has not, is not the case. We have actually gotten, gotten better, um, uh, as far as moving away from extreme poverty. Now, so if you live on $2.10 a day, you're not in extreme poverty. This is not saying there's not poor people. This is, uh, this is on, on, and, and the fact that it's still $1.90, uh, and that hasn't increased with inflation. Also a little concerning with how you manipulate numbers and where does $1.90 come from? Um, I know it's, uh, you know, marginalized based on different countries. Anyway, uh, but before I throw stones here, let's try to look at the positives that it does look like some of the interventions around the world have helped the extreme poverty rate. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of poor uh, uh, places around, around on earth, but that the extreme poverty rate does appear uh, to be decreasing, which is uh, very much a, a positive. Um, another one is the literacy rate. All right, so I was guesstimating based on 790 million, that was about one in nine, one in 10 people uh, uh, were illiterate. Um, the literacy rate, regardless of whatever my awful math is, has steadily gone up across the world over time, which is fantastic. Because uh, uh, literacy is very important to be able to communicate with people. Uh, social media, the internet, be able to research stuff, get information, better yourself, you know, not just knowing a contract or having to go read a novel, but being able to uh, thrive in your own life and taking some control of your own life when you can communicate with people in a variety of formats. Uh, so literacy is drastically important uh, in people's success in life as, as the, like, the lowest tier form of uh, expectation for any type of success. So that has also gone up over time, which, so my old numbers, again, have dwindled and, and fantastic. Now, uh, as far as poverty goes, you're really drawing a very unique line here, the $1.90, all right? Less than $2 a day poverty. Uh, that's not a lot of money. I don't know how well you are of money, but $2 a day ain't a lot of money. So if you made $7 a day, shoot, you're three times the poverty rate of anywhere else around the world. And in places like America, that is, is going to be a struggle. If you made $5 a day in America, there is a, a chance you would not, that, that you could starve to death in America and you would be at extreme poverty by American standards, but not the UN standards, which would rank you there. So with that being said, the general areas uh, that really, really struggle with poverty, all right, are, are a lot of the areas that have struggled uh, with food over a long period of time. It's, it's, you know, back when societies are getting formed, mass production of food, 
uh, you know, w was a necessity. So without the ability to mass produce food, it kind of sh kind of stagnates your whole society and helps it keep it from getting off the ground. And this is why you see poverty in, in a lot of uh, regions like that. There's also places that were colonized that were raised for their natural resources during the like imperialistic stage, European countries, America going into these poor countries, taking all their natural resources from them, not paying them anything, and then colonization ends. Hooray! They're you know they're free, but all their natural resources have been raised. They're uh, been completely wiped out of any anything that they could sell to get back on their feet. Deforestation, uh, crops are destroyed that previously could have grown because of, of the changes in all types of, of, of situations. So uh, I, I want to sit here and simplify and kind of explain based on this map of why different areas are like they are. And as the more I look at it, every situation is unique, right? But a lot of times uh, countries either deal with outside influences. And when I say outside influence, natural disasters, drought, uh, uh, things like that, or other countries uh dealing with war dealing with uh uh being invaded being colonized or just corruption inside your own government hey everybody grows food and then you sell it to a third country and then your own people can't can't eat uh but globalization all right so so the question here is i'll put this up here so, so, so we can talk about it and you can understand where i'm getting at with this why does globalization make it even harder for some poor countries to gain wealth while other countries it helps them achieve prosperity globalization just means you're connected to all the other countries it is hard to gain wealth when you have nothing to provide to the other countries outside of like cheap labor uh, if you don't have any natural resources, uh, it is hard for other countries to, to find value in, in, in what you want or resources or something that, that, that you can provide. So what ends up happening is uh, the poor countries end up being on the losing end of that trade with, with the richer country. And the richer country usually gets richer off of the poor countries because they can pay the poor people to make their products uh, at less cost because they're happy with any jobs. Happy is a relative term. Because the richer countries want the profits, poor people, hey, that $2 a day that you're getting, that's probably coming from a richer country uh, as it is. So it's very hard for poorer countries to really thrive in globalization because they don't have anything to trade with to start with. While simultaneously, uh, rich countries, uh, they can go into poor countries, have them make all their products, and rich countries are actually getting richer because of globalization based on the, the divide of poverty. And while over time it has gotten better with poverty, uh, the expectation was it was going to equalize everybody's economy, and it really didn't. Um, the rich countries continue to get richer, and the poor countries kind of, uh, they did remain the poor countries. Now, this one here seems crazy to us, all right? Uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time here explaining uh, why this is so uh, ridiculous and why it still exists. World hunger, all right? So present day, all right, um, the, this present day map 2021, these are places on earth that have chronic hunger. Uh, uh, so it says up to 811 million people, one out of 10 of the global population do not get enough to eat. Whereas cardiovascular disease, number one cause of death among people, which in large part can be caused by obesity in the richer uh, uh, country. How many diets are there in, in America? Uh, America is more concerned with not eating too much as they are with where's food gonna come from on a large scale. Yet there's still absolutely, there is uh, 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 food insecurity in America, absolutely. All right, uh, on individual uh, situations. But entire continents like Africa, America throws away more food than it will ever eat, and a lot of these modern countries do. So how in the world are there people still starving to death when their other countries are literally throwing it away? Like, how is that possible? Because the logic is, hey, let's not throw the food away, because this is what you would think would happen. This is the logic you would think would happen. Let's not throw the food away. Let's take it and give it to countries that need food. 
We're not even going to eat it. Let's give it to them. They'll be happy with it. And you would be right. Cool. It's probably really hard to get it there. Nah, nah. We could fly over in planes and drop it to them. Yeah, but there's probably not people willing to pay for it. Tons of people willing to pay for it. Okay, well, I'm sure the United Nations... No, no, no. The United Nations will uh, facilitate the whole thing. So, Mr. Wags, if you're telling me, a lot of these places, there's enough food that we can get to them. There's people willing to do it, and there's money and resources to get these people food. And they're still starving to death? Why? It's complicated. Oh, great, Mr. Wags. Now he's going to talk about some big, like, something I'm not going to understand. I want to try not to do that here with, with food. I'm going to give you two specific examples of places that have starved and their specific uh, uh, situations that they dealt with. Uh, and then hopefully understand that all of these places have their own unique situations, whether it's extreme poverty, not being able to buy food. Again, look at me. I'm trying to go into the macro version. I told you I wasn't going to do that. All right. We did macro and poverty on different reasons why people are poor and rich in the countrywide. Let's go to individual countries here. Ethiopia, 1980s. All right. So Ethiopia uh, got in the middle of a civil war. All right. Uh, so, so not only do you have half the, the government doesn't like half because it's a country fighting itself. So there's the people turning against each other. There's tons of corruption in the government. Corruption based on which side of the government that you're on, obviously. Uh, they were withholding food from people on top of massive uh, drought. So places that could grow food because that wasn't raining, they, they couldn't grow it anyway. On top of those two uh, uh, ridiculous things, with the Civil War, uh, a lot of the, the people that would typically be farming are going to be fighting because it's, it's a civil war. Uh, it was so bad. It looked like 8 million people in Ethiopia was going to starve to death. And the uh, United Nations basically made a concerted effort. Everybody got together and like, we are coming in there and basically forced food into the country. Because the government is in the middle of civil war and corruption. We're trying to manipulate any political gain or food or famine for political gain for their side of this war. So it wasn't as simple as just dropping food off because the government didn't want that to happen. Uh... Uh, or you know, because they didn't want their the opposition half of the country to receive the food, so it, it it gets ridiculous. So that's why it's like on the outside forces, there's this benevolent idea of doing it, but inside Ethiopia, there was no way to really distribute the food to the people uh, because there was an active attempt to prevent certain groups from getting the food. So the people that were starving to death, it was pretty much uh, set up like that. In addition to all that, uh, uh, what, what, what is uh, 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 crazy, well, in addition to it, is that the United Nations kind of goes in and uh, does end up forcing food in there on, on a larger scale and is able to help Ethiopia round the, the curve in that specific crisis. So if you look at a map, that is why the 1980s Ethiopia was starving to death, and it was a known thing, and everybody just had to kind of sit there and watch it. So the idea was you have to take a more aggressive, assertive approach when countries are in this situation, like a civil war, to basically go in and get the food directly to the people. That's th people thought that worked after the 1980s because it worked in Ethiopia. Let's bring us over here to Somalia in the 1990s. And this is more specifically with, with America. So some, uh, Somalia... Uh, same region, actually, as, as Ethiopia. Also hit with drought, really struggling uh, with food. Civil war, uh, very similar to Ethiopia. Very similar. So America says, hey, we're, we're going to go in here and we're going to help out uh, uh, the Somalians here so they don't starve to death. Because there's a lot of innocent people in Somalia. Let's get them food. We have plenty of food. We're just going to throw it away if we don't use it. We'll spend the money. We'll go over here and, and, and we'll drop it. So what America started to do is instead of like asking the Somali government, hey, here's some food, we distribute it, knowing there's going to be corruption, there's all these other stuff, America's like, oh, we got this. So America would just go and drop food or, to all the villages, like, like big crates for, for, from helicopters, uh, and, and drop all this food, and the idea was the local villages would come out, they would get their food, they wouldn't starve to death, hooray. All right, that was the idea. Well, what ended up happening is the warlords 
in these uh, villages, they would come out, they would take all the food, and then they would basically control all the food and therefore control the society because they're like, you want to eat, you're going to do what we tell you to do. America's like, oh, did not want to eat this food used as a weapon, which is exactly what it was doing. So America has to start putting troops here with the food. So you got pictures like this. This is a, a, a painting. I think it's cover of a book uh, of troops here in Somalia making sure that the food gets to the Somali people so that they don't starve. Here's another actual photograph of soldiers uh, in Somalia. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, hey, here's some food. And all, all they're really designed to do here, these handful of Marines would, would land with the food, just make sure that the warlords aren't coming up and taking all the food in the trucks and then controlling it. They just make sure the community can come up and get it. So it seemed to, like, to be a pretty cushy job until, all right, and this is where it got crazy, uh, the issue becomes one of these warlords over a city in Somalia called Mogadishu shoots down one of these American military helicopters, uh, which is called a Black Hawk, uh, and shoots it down in Mogadishu and captures multiple <laughs> American Marines. Uh, it is a like a, like a worldwide crisis. Like, like so, the rebels in Mogadishu are attacking the people, bringing in food for the people. So the United States has to uh, send in special forces. It, it's a whole thing on, on, on TV. One of the soldiers gets killed. And on, on worldwide TV, uh, the dead body of the American soldier gets drugged through the streets behind the Jeep of, a, uh, uh, of one of these uh, Somali rebels. And it's like shocking to the world. So the America sends in special forces. We get the uh, uh, the couple people that were taking uh, that were captured from this helicopter crash. Uh, 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 get them out. Uh, a few Americans uh, died. Americans completely wrecked shop in Mogadishu uh, to get these troops out uh, uh, of, of harm's way. They make an entire movie on it called Black Hawk Down. And America has to make the decision after this: Are we as a country going to continue to? Uh, you know, provide Somalia with this food and, and, and escalate this conflict? Or are we going to say, look, we tried to be nice and we're out? And that's the decision America makes, is we out. And you can't really blame America for this. It's it's one of those things where it's, it's such, and tons of people in Somalia starved to death. This is actually the origins of the Somali pirates when they're taking over these oil tankers and uh, other, because people aren't just going to sit here and starve to death. They're going to get money somehow and uh, uh, you know, taking over oil tankers and stuff is actually one of the um, negative effects of this entire uh, situation. Everything has a cause and effect. I've always found it interesting that the movie Black Hawk Down, which is made, is, is all based on the military. We make entire movies over airplanes getting shot down, and, and, and but nobody makes movies about famine. And a lot more people die from famine uh, because it's not an exciting way to die. It's a horrific way to die. And it is still a known issue in the world. But I want to end today with all this negativity to reiterate some positives. The extreme poverty rate since 1990 around the world has been cut in half. Uh, the literacy rate is increasing. Um, famine is less common. It still exists. There's always going to be a, a, a touchy situation where getting food to people is, is a difficulty, even with the concerted help of the United Nations. But what we need to keep in mind is there's a lot of places who aren't dealing with all that drama and just really bad luck drought situations like that and they need help in the united nations really does go in and help those countries that doesn't have all the additional drama surrounding places like ethiopia in the 1980s or, or somalia in the 1990s so the, the pros do outweigh the cons but it is uh it is still necessary to explain how you still have places in the 21st century that have food shortages when we throw away more food than we would ever eat on earth. So the question here is, give some examples why it can be difficult to provide starving people with food. We talked about Ethiopia and Somalia. Give it uh, specific examples of them, of, of how it's difficult to get people food, even when there is uh, the ability and resources to do so. Um, so explain that to me. Uh, answer that completely.
Uh, that's as far as we're going to get today. See you guys tomorrow.